Well, good afternoon, everybody. Good to see everybody. I'm going to start right on time here at, uh, at 1 o'clock. Just to introduce myself, my name is Dr. Phil Thibault. I'm Professor and Chair of Psychotic Disorders at uh, Dalhousie University in Halifax in, in Canada. And I'll be chairing the, uh, the session today. We've had some changes in our symposium, I uh, have to let you know right up front, uh, from our initial submission. Um, although going to some of the other symposium, it's not necessarily uh, something that's unique to, to this one. Uh, Dr. Kathy Aitchinson was going to be chairing it, uh, actually co-chairing it. Um, she wasn't able to make it. Uh, Myself, uh, so the symposium is the vulnerability to the effects of cannabis on transition to psychosis. Very fortunate to have Dr. Murray here uh, with us. We'll be doing the, the first talk. Uh, as per the program, I'll be doing the, uh, the second talk as well. Um, it's the last two talks where there's a bit of a change. Uh, we actually had submitted uh, enough uh, time. Dr. Kron uh, from Netherlands wasn't able to, uh, to make it. And we have fortunate to have Dr. Candace Crocker here who will be talking about uh, imaging in, in this area, your imaging in this area. And unfortunately, uh, two days ago, I did get an email from Dr. Gene Addington, uh, who was ill uh, and wasn't able to travel from, uh, from Canada. So I know there's a fair bit of change there. So if, if you're looking at your program, there's myself and Dr. Murray. Our abstracts are in there. Candace's, unfortunately, uh, didn't make it in, but it's still uh, going to be a great talk. So there is only going to be three of us uh, for speaking this afternoon, um, which allows us to not pay attention to this 20-minute clock that's necessarily here in front of us. Not that we'll go on for long, uh, but it also allow us uh, some opportunities for some good discussions as well. Um, and I think probably a good way of doing this, I think it's sometimes useful to have a couple of questions after each presenter, um, but then we won't go into a whole, we'll just minima, you know, keep that to a minimum, just a couple of questions that's specific to the talk, and then we'll keep most of the discussion uh, for at the end of the symposium. Hopefully, really what this does is that all three talks will, will uh, create that better discussion around this particular topic. Um, so without uh, any further delay, so we can get going, Dr. Murray will present our first talk. Oops, only one way up and down. So I really am here. <laughs> so, okay. And I'm going to talk about actually nothing to do with my abstract, I'm afraid. I cannabis risk for, for psychosis, where, what, and who. So whether you develop a cannabis-related psychosis obviously depends on having exposure to cannabis. And in the USA, there's a huge experiment going on at present, as you know, to do studies of cannabis or THC in animals is very expensive. You have to uh, heat the cages, you've got to feed the animals, be inspected, and so it's a, a very big palaver. Americans come for free. They, they, are, they, are, they don't cost anything. And there's now this large experiment on exposure to cannabis starting in different states. So a number of states, notably Colorado and Washington have legalized recreational cannabis. And so you can buy I, everything from 0% THC cannabis with only, uh, only CBD in it to 80% a, a THC. I, <clears throat> this is uh, California. And you, California has, has medical marijuana, so you need to get approval from a doctor. But you can go and lie on the beach all day, and when you lie on the beach, you get sunburned, you get a headache, you don't feel very well. But there is a solution. You can go and be evaluated for medical marijuana, and you, you go and you see a doctor. And some places you don't actually have to see the doctor, you can do it online. I, in some cities, I think, and you were asked one question in some cities, uh, does marijuana make you feel better? And if you say yes, then you can have medical marijuana in these particular, it, it varies a lot. <clears throat> and of course, it costs you $60. So some, some, some doctors are getting extremely rich. Now there are, more star, there are more dispensaries for cannabis than Starbucks in Los Angeles. So there are huge numbers of uh, dispensaries. So not surprisingly, cannabis consumption has uh, gone up in the USA. So if you, the past year prevalence has increased 
from 4.1%, this is in the whole population, uh, to 9.5% between 2002 and 2013. Situation in Europe is much more complicated. And uh, there are some countries, so this is, uh, this is students <coughs> and uh, uh, school, school students. So there are some countries, uh, so the, the, the darker the red, then the, high, the higher the proportion who are being, have, have used cannabis uh, amongst uh, the school children. And there are, uh, so traditionally the Czech Republic and France have, uh, have, ha have had high rates. Britain also had uh, high rates, but cannabis consumption has fallen significantly in Britain by about 10%. A overall and 25% in uh, young people. Uh, whereas there are other countries such as Norway, which had a very low base, is catching up a bit, and Italy, where we are at present. Italy is, is now equal to Britain, but Italy is going up and Britain is, has been uh, going down. So it's, there's different forces uh, in, uh, in, 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 dif in different countries. Oops, why doesn't, oh, there we go. So, obviously one important, so one important factor is the potency of cannabis. And this is data from Marta de Forti, who is in the audience, and I'll uh, present other of her work. And this is a study that we did in, uh, you know when professors talk, when they say we did this, they mean somebody else did it. In this case, it's, it's Marta. Uh, so this is, uh, <coughs> this is South, South London. Here's the Thames here. Uh, the, and, and, and this is the area of our uh, psychiatric services. And we had 410 patients in their first episode of psychosis, 370 population-based healthy controls, all interviewed using the, a modified version of the Cannabis Experience Questionnaire. And in the UK, at, this, this, at the time we did the study between 2005 and 2010, there were essentially two types of cannabis that you could get. You could get a hashish or resin, sometimes called soap bar, because it's compacted like a, a soap bar, and it would have about maybe about 4% of THC and 4% of CBD in it. And as you know, CBD is thought to ameliorate these pro-psychotogenic effects of THC. On the other hand, now you can also get high-potency <coughs> high skunk. I, in fact, we couldn't do this study now any longer because the high-potency skunk has taken over the market and hashish is hardly available. So I, this would have about 16% of THC in it and a less than 1% of CBD in it. So it's a... a, a, a it's stronger in two aspects, one more THC and less of the ameliorating CBD. And it's, very, it's rather smelly, so it's, 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 it's called skunk. So this is the risk, so that we have the cases and we have the controls. This is the risk of being a case. If you, according to what you're, what you're smoking. So these are people who've never used cannabis, obviously the reference population one. People who are smoking uh, hashish, it almost looked as if they were slightly protected, but it's not, that's not significant. And there, I think there are technical reasons in the study as to why, the, why it, this, uh, it, 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 the, the odds ratio is, is lower than one. Uh, so I don't, I'm not suggesting that it's safe to use uh, <coughs> a a hashish, but certainly we didn't have much of any, any significant effect of it. But it was people who used a skunk less than once a week, high potency cannabis less than once a week, uh, at weekends, and particularly if you used it every day. So the odds ratio was, was over five if you were taking daily high potency uh, cannabis. So certainly in South London, where we work, it's the high potency, the daily use of high potency cannabis that seems to carry a, the, the, the biggest risk. So the, another question then is what happens if you continue to use cannabis? And uh, there are many studies and one of our PhD students, Tabia Schuller, carried out a meta-analysis with Sagnik Bhattacharya uh, to look at the effect of 
continuing versus stopping cannabis. And essentially, she found that if you, the best outcome was in people who had previously used cannabis and then stopped. The next best outcome was people who had never used, used cannabis. And the worst outcome was people who used cannabis and continued to use cannabis. But in the meta-analysis, she wasn't able to look at potency. But we were able to do that in London in a follow-up of people from the GAP study and also a similar group of first episode psychotic patients from uh, the, uh, the, the London uh, centre of the EUGI. So this is Tabia Schuller's paper, which is, was published in the Lancet online in, in August. And so this was, she successfully followed up and interviewed 256 first onset psychotic people uh, at, at two or more years and therefore was able to assess their outcome at two years. And she compared the outcome according to their pattern of cannabis use. So not only the potency, not only were they just continuing or not, but were they continuing how frequently and what were they taking. And so you could be, you could, the sample was divided into these groups. You could be a former regular user who then stopped. You could be somebody who never was a regular user, maybe just used once in, your li in their life. An intermittent user, you could continue using hash, very few people actually. You could continue using a, a, a skunk, but not very often. And you could continue using skunk, high potency cannabis uh, frequently. And so the, this slide summarizes the outcome. It looks horrific, uh, but uh, I'll explain it <coughs> to you. So along the top, we have measures of relapse. Did you relapse or not? Number of relapses, length of relapse, time to relapse. Did, were you uh, either, did you have to be visited by the home treatment team daily, or did you have to be admitted into hospital? versus doing fine without a lot of uh, uh, intensive care. And down the side is patterns of cannabis use and other drug use. So if you're, and, and excuse me, pink means you're doing quite well. Uh, dark, darker pink means you're somewhere in the middle. Green uh, is associated with poor outcome. So essentially you can see if you've never, you're never, never used, you do quite well. If you're an intermittent user, uh, you, you maybe need a bit more care, but altogether you're doing all right. If you continue using hash, it doesn't seem to make any difference. You seem to do all right. Uh, but of course, there were, there, there were only nine people who, who continued using hash. Continued using skunk infrequently. You needed more, more care, or maybe you were admitted to hospital more or, need, or needed uh, a more intensive home treatment. But it was the continued users of high, fre uh, high frequency users of high potency cannabis who had the worst outcome. Uh, more likely to re relapse, odds ratio of three, greater number of relapses, shorter time to relapse, needing more intensive care. Ethnicity in London, in London has a big effect. So if you're not, not white British, particularly if you're a black migrant, you tend to do worse. So that was an, a, a non-drug related effect. If you used other drugs, it had some effect on, on relapse. Cigarettes, I think, is becoming increasingly interesting as a possible a cause of a psychosis and a cause of severity of psychosis. It, it had a weak effect. Uh, and the other thing, of course, was that patients who didn't, didn't adhere to their medication had a, had, a, had a poor outcome. So the bottom line of this is that the regular users, the, those who continued using high-potency skunk, had the worst outcome. So maybe if we can persuade our patients to reduce the, the frequency, that, well, at best if we could get them to stop using cannabis, but as you know, it's quite often quite difficult to do that. So if uh, we could reduce the frequency or we could uh, perhaps persuade them to switch from high potency to low potency cannabis, that might improve the outcome. You might think that's a bit, uh, it's not a very ambitious uh, target. It's a bit like saying to people who are alcoholic, we would prefer that you stop drinking altogether, but if you're not willing to do that, maybe you would give up vodka and go back to, to, to lager instead. So that's the, the, the outcome. 
This is saying, and so that's the effects of high potency cannabis in the UK on incidence and on outcome. Uh, and the question then is, what about the rest of the rest of the EU? It's a sad thing for British people to say, what about the rest of the EU? Because we, we, will be able, we won't be able to say that in the, in the future. We'll be able to have to say the, the Europe over there. But anyways, until then, uh, this is a large study which was reported in detail by Craig Morgan uh, uh, yesterday. This is a 12 million euro study uh, looking at the incidence of psychosis across uh, 16 sites. In, in, in Europe, uh, led, led by Jim Van Oss, Craig, uh, Craig Morgan, and these analyses uh, done by <coughs> uh, James Kirkbride and his students. Uh, so uh, we, we had tried to get in each country a big city and then a smaller city, or a, a, an, all, maybe incorporating some rural areas. So uh, for example, this is the UK, the incidence Per, uh, of cases per hundred of psychosis per hundred thousand in London was 64 per hundred thousand, in Cambridge was 19 per hundred thousand. So, as is uh, usually been found in the past in northern, northern countries, that the incidence is much higher in uh, cities than in the country areas. Uh, but if we just look at uh, the other countries as a whole, the Netherlands altogether, the uh, Amsterdam and Leiden, the incidence it was 40 per 100,000 in Paris, in France, and in Paris and a rural area, it was 26 per 100,000. In uh, Spain, overall, it was 21 per 100,000. Didn't seem to matter in Spain whether you were in Madrid or Barcelona or in a country, country region. In Bologna and Verona, it was 20 per 100,000. And in Palermo, it was 12 per 100,000. Now, these, there was a lot of effort put into training people, into making sure that we got every case in these uh, different catchment areas. Now, we may not have got every case, but there's no way that the people in Sicily missed a, four out of, a five out of six people with psychosis. They might have missed the odd one, but we, I guess we would miss the odd one in London as well. But it looks like the incidence in London is hugely greater than it is in Palermo. So why do you think this is? Sunshine? Is John McGrath here? No. Mediterranean diet? No. My bet is it's the Pope. That, uh, <laughs> that, uh, that uh, no, it, it, it could, excuse me, the po new Pope is a very able fellow, and obviously, uh, but it's too recent to have had any effect. So, uh, but it, one possibility, it might be families, uh, because the family structure is still much uh, uh, more co cohesive in, uh, uh, in Italy and Spain. Uh, another possibility is migration. And when we look at migrants, when we take migrants out, we've done a study, for example, comparing Palermo with London. Alicia Muli has, has done this. And uh, Alicia found that if you took out migrants, a huge, uh, the, 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 the disparity between London and uh, Palermo disappeared because, of course, London's had migrants for 50 years. Palermo's only just started getting migrants, so they didn't really show up in, in, this, in the sample yet. But there still remained a difference. So what about, what about drug taking? So we, one can look at uh, the... So again, this is Marta's data, and this is looking at uh, the impact of daily use on risk of psychosis across these different uh, uh, centres. So this is uh, people who didn't, didn't use uh, cannabis in London versus people who did use cannabis in London, and the, uh, the adjusted odds ratio, adjusted for age, gender, ethnicity, and use of other drugs, is uh, <coughs> 4.2. Cambridge, although the incidence is much lower, the odds ratio remains much about the same. Holland, pretty high in Holland, actually, about the odds ratio went up to eight. Uh, Spain, France, uh, the other countries, rather similar, similar to, 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 to London. So that's just looking at a daily use of any cannabis. But of course, across Europe, people are smoking also all different types of cannabis and 
the, can the cannabis scene is changing uh, very rapidly. So the, in the best data come from Holland, where they publish the, the, the potency of different types of cannabis every year. And uh, this is just to, to give you an example that, uh, for example, this is the THC concent concentrate in, in hashish, in, which in, in the UK is very low. Uh, a, a THC concentration in, in, in the UK would be around about 4 or 5 percent. But here you can get a, a nidder hash, a 67 percent THC, or this other form, 27 percent THC. So not only is the concentration going up, but there's a sort of race between the, the, the producers of a hash to try and catch up with, with those who have been uh, gr growing since Amila. And then you can also get uh, resin oils and you can now get wax dabs and other forms. So it's quite, it's a complicated business trying to uh, standardize uh, concentrations of THC across, across Europe. So one way of doing it is just to take forms of cannabis which have more than 10 more than 10 percent THC versus those less than THC and this is the odds ratio uh, so this is, this is daily use of high potency cannabis THC greater than 10 percent on risk of psychosis across the different countries and so here is a <coughs> non-consumers non, non of cannabis in London uh, those who are taking daily daily skunk the odds ratio was, was eight, uh, <coughs> Cambridge four, Holland a 7.2, and I guess Holland and, and the UK are the two countries that have the, mo the most high potency uh, cannabis. In fact, when you look at the other uh, countries, high potency cannabis has almost no impact uh, because it's not very available. Uh, and uh, the colleagues from Palermo found really no effect. In fact, they only, in the cases and controls, there were only two people who had smoked a uh, high potency cannabis, and the two of them had gone on uh, vacation to Amsterdam, which is where they encountered the high potency cannabis. So it's interesting that, uh, that there's a much bigger effect of cannabis in those countries that have, that have a high potency. So I guess you have to decide which continent you're going to be on, uh, you have to decide which country you're going to be in, and then there's, di there's availability of different forms of cannabis with a different uh, effect on your risk of psychosis. But of course, not all Dutch people go psychotic when they use, uh, use cannabis. People vary in their susceptibility, and there's been a lot of interest in the possibility that uh, there may be genetic a predisposition. You all know this, that you meet a 21-year-old 20, young man who's gone psychotic and you say very tentatively, do you think it, you're getting unwell could have anything to do with the amount of, of uh, cannabis that you were smoking? And he would say, no, of course it couldn't because all my friends smoke at least as much as me. But maybe they differ gen genetically. The first gene to be associated with uh, risk of cannabis was uh, the Compte Catecholomethyl transfer is, which we, in a study in Dunedin, we suggested that the Val-Val genotype increased the, increased the risk. And it, in the Dunedin sample, it had quite a striking effect. Subsequent samples it's, have been contradictory. Some have uh, produced a positive effect. Some have not produced a positive effect. We have be, we, we've become mo more interested in uh, two other genes, a DRD2, the dopamine receptor gene, and a gene called AKT1, which is post the D2 receptor. So here, here, is, here is the D2 receptor. This is a, a, a SNP for the D, a DRD2 gene. Uh, excuse me, does, and then AKT is involved in the signaling pathway af, after the uh, <coughs> a, 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 after the the, 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 the synapse. So. This is work particularly by Marco Calisi, and this is saying that we've got two potential risk genes, and each of them has two, two alleles at this particular SNP. So you can have no risk alleles, you can have a risk allele from DRD2, you can have a risk allele from AKT1, 
or you can have more than one risk allele from, from, from you could have two risk alleles. It, 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 it would be a very small proportion from, from, from a, bo, bo, both genes. So, but if you take, if you don't take cannabis, then it doesn't matter what uh, risk alleles you have. Uh, so there's very little significant difference. There's no significant difference in people who don't, in their risk of, of a psychosis if they, don't, if they never use cannabis. But if you use cannabis, your risk of psychosis depends on, at least in this study, depends on whether you have no risk alleles or you have one risk allele from either DRD2 or AKT1, or you have two or more risk alleles. So uh, you can see that, uh, that, the, uh, that it's... Uh, does seem to be quite a, a significant effect carried by these these two uh, SNPs. So, obviously, we're now in the era of the polygenic risk score. So now the EU GI study is attempting to look at the, po the polygenic risk score versus cannabis use, but it's not uh, not yet calculated. So, why would genes involved postsynaptically seem to be particularly relevant when most of what we know about psychosis is that psychosis results from an excess release of dopamine. So usually people with psychosis release, synthesize and release too much dopamine, but not cannabis users. Cannabis users and other drug addicts get a low level of the, their dopamine release is suppressed the longer they, 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 they use the drug. And if you look at animals, this is a study by Natalie Ginovar from, uh, from uh, Geneva, and she gave THC to rats. And what she found was they actually have decreased uh, dopamine presynaptically. Uh, pre so they, they, they don't synthesize and release the same amount of dopamine. But what they, ha they have is they get super sensitivity at the receptor. So it may be in ordinary psychosis, people are psychotic because they're producing too much dopamine, but in cannabis-related psychosis, they're not producing too much dopamine, but the receptor may be more likely to become supersensitive. And the two genes that we have found uh, carry some risk. They seem to be associated with this, the, either on the synapse or post-synaptically. So that's, that's uh, me through that I think uh, there's a number of factors associated with a with, uh, risk of psychosis. One I didn't mention was age of onset of uh, cannabis use, but I think we're in interesting times in relation to cannabis as to whether with the move towards decriminalization and legalization, we're going to see more cannabis consumption. That seems to be the case in the USA, although it's not inevitable. And then there is also a move towards more potent uh, types of cannabis. And then I guess we're now in a, we might be in a position to say to particular individuals, you will be at particular risk. So I'd be happy to answer any questions if I still have time. Two questions. Yep. So I'm supposed to be the hostess. Uh, if there are any questions, sorry. Uh, as you know, in Holland, there is a lot of talk about legalizing uh, cannabis production. And uh, so, in can cannabis, you legalize the sale of it, but it has to be produced illegally. Yes, at present. yes, and, it's a very and, uh, and the production is in the hand of gangsters. Yes, so. Should we advise the politicians when they uh, legalize uh, cannabis that they have uh, some that they only uh, have to uh, produce uh, cannabis with a low uh, THC uh, uh, in it, so we can put the gangsters out of uh, 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 power and uh, produce much quieting, uh, more quieting uh, cannabis? I think this would be a very nice scenario. 
you have to think, where are we at with alcohol? It's rather the same. If, if the capitalist economy was worked on in such a way that the producers were interested in the effects of drugs, then we would only produce a lager and beer and maybe a, 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 small, amount, a small amount of wine. We wouldn't be producing a whiskey and, uh, and vodka. So I think if it was possible, I think Uruguay is an example where uh, cannabis is legalized, but under very Stalinist sort of conditions that you have to get rations and you have to go to special shops. I, in the USA, it's it's the Wild West, and that uh, the they're, they're, they're cannabis consumption and legalization is being driven not by little uh, uh, local producers, but by big entrepreneurial companies. For example, I'm rather sad that uh, having listened to Bob Marley uh, for 30, 30 or 40, 30 years now, I, that the biggest uh, commercial brand of uh, cannabis is Marley Gold with $50 million investment in, uh, ready for advertising and, and marketing. So it would be very nice if we could do that, but I, I suspect that the power of capitalism would over, overwhelm well, whelm this. But uh, well, one, one never knows. Thank you, uh, Dr. Robin Murray. Uh, your team was proposing a susceptibility gene in the past. Uh, what happened to that theory? Well, I, was, I did uh, talk a little bit about susceptibility genes. You are, are, you still, are you still proposing the val, val, and methionine? No. I, I, well, we don't know. So we'll hear more about this later in the symposium. So we did this, the, 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 the Dunedin study and we found that the Valval genotype of Compt had a very significant, significant effect. Other studies have, a, it, of course, the Dunedin sample is a whole population sample and nobody else has really been able to look at that, but people have looked at, uh, at hospitalized samples versus controls. Uh, it hasn't come out consistently. We have recently given a THC to 120, again, when I say we, Dan Freeman gave a THC to 120 individ schizotypal individuals and measured their COMPT. And he did not find then a proportion develop a, a, an acute psychosis, mild psychotic s symptoms. I, he did not find that uh, the valval -val increased the risk of psychotic symptoms. What it did do, however, was the people who had valval, -val, when given THC, they had a greater decrement in their cognitive function. So their memory was more, more affected than people with, uh, with, with, with met met. So, the complication, and you are a good person to discuss this with, is because COMPT is very different in different ethnic groups. So we ha you really need a pure white or a pure black sample to uh, look at, say, COMPT versus cannabis, because it differs very greatly by ethnicity. And having a, a London sample, our sample is all mixed up. So we, can, we can't properly test that in, in our, our sample. But we may hear uh, later, uh, and I guess we'll be able to look in the EU GI st study at this properly. So I think the jury is out. So uh, my, uh, currently my money is more on DRD2 and AKT1. Okay, and uh, I, I, that's me finished. And now we go back to, to our, our, our chairman. Phil is, go, is going to take us through, I think, his, some of his own work, but also some of Cathy Hitchison's uh, uh, work, at work as well. So this is, uh, I'm looking forward to this. Thank you. Of course, it's always a pleasure to follow Professor Murray in talking, so. Uh, Do we have the slides up, coming up? Uh, so I am uh, going to present uh, some of our data, uh, some of our Canadian uh, data. So uh, you know, this is talking about a, a white sample. We'll, we'll have a, uh, we'll be able to see that. Um, so I will be talking about cannabis and and Compt. Uh, 
uh, and vulnerability to psychosis as well. And I think, in, and I'm glad actually uh, Dr. Murray showed uh, some of the UK or the European data on cannabis because I will show you some of our Canadian data as well. Because um, I think it's nice to see the, uh, uh, the similarities as well as some of the differences that we have with respect to cannabis use in, in, in our country. Um, we will be focusing on COMP for this, but I'll allude to some other things uh, uh, down the road. Um, yeah, so this particular study that we're going to uh, be talking a little about is an East-West collaboration that we had in, in Canada. Um, I do have to put the map of Canada there for our, all our European friends here. Uh, so I'm uh, in Halifax, so I'm on the East Coast. Uh, of Halifax, and our collaborators were actually in Edmonton, Alberta, uh, which is what we'd call the, the West uh, in the mountains. Um, part of this collaboration existed because I did work in Alberta, moved to Halifax, and we were able to kind of keep these wonderful interactions uh, going. Uh, the interesting thing about this is that I run the neuroimaging arm of this project, so that is my background is neuroimaging, and solely I've been moving into more service delivery work as well. Uh, so I'm not a geneticist uh, by background, so which also absolves me of some of the particular questions you may have of some of the genetics as well. So, uh, so this is some of the stats of, of cannabis use in, in our country, in, in Canada. And so you can see perhaps some of the similarities and some of the differences as well uh, to your own countries. Um, our prevalence has increased uh, significantly over the last uh, 20 years, and currently we say that about 34% of the population uh, have used uh, in their lifetime. Um, and the cannabis use and dependence rate is greater than any other illicit uh, drug or dependence combined. The interesting point is, is the next one, is that, and this sort of surprised me, uh, is that ca our Canada's youth uh, has the highest 12-month prevalence rate of cannabis use out of all the developed countries. Um, and this is 2013 data, so it's fairly recent data. Um, it's not recent enough where I can blame it on our constant stream of media coming from the U.S. on the drama of the elections. Um, but it is recent enough that our, 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 you know, our, our youth are using a significant amount of cannabis. Uh, almost 1 in 20 youth report using it on a daily or almost daily basis. And the average reported age of use is around 15. Uh, although I was involved with another study that was organized in a slightly different way, and the average sort of uh, first-time use is usually around 12, 12, 13 uh, in, in Canada. So it is, cannabis is, is a problem within our, in our country too. Um, I did, in somewhat tongue-in-cheek, put up the similarities between our Canadian maple leaf and the cannabis leaf there. I'm not sure if that has anything to do with it. So th this is also another interesting uh, thing, because I, I do some work with the Canadian Centre on Substance Abuse, CCSA, uh, which is an arm's length organization in Canada that's funded by the federal government. And this is a, a qualitative study that was done uh, a couple of years ago. I'm really trying to focus on uh, qualitative, what are you thinking about, uh, about the use of, of, of cannabis? Um, and, you know, and not surprisingly, I mean, most of you think of it as a, you know, that harmless, natural substance, right? There's nothing wrong with it. Um, so it's not seen as a, quote, a drug. Um, there's often mistaken beliefs about uh, its effects. And a lot of, uh, as mentioned here, a lot of the youth actually feel that it can cure cancer. Not that it can help in the treatment, that actually can cure cancer. Um, there's a lot of confusion about uh, the legality and medical use, um, and a lot of mixed beliefs about, uh, about driving as well, which is kind of interesting. Um, as a lot of them felt that it was... Um, uh, that you're able to drive while, while, on, while high on, on pot. Um, and a lot of people thought that it was actually better than being drunk, uh, drunk driving. So that's what the youth were saying. And of course the research is showing otherwise. Um, so we've been focusing from the CCSA point of view, focusing on these myths um, that the youth have and, and in itself producing some uh, uh, materials that we have to educate the public on this. And I guess I forgot to mention at the beginning, I'm sure people are aware uh, that under our new Prime Minister, Justin Trudeau, uh, is that we are moving towards legalization uh, and regulation uh, of uh, cannabis. And there's actually, they hope to have that in place by next year. Uh, I was asked to speak to a federal task force on this and they hope to have the, uh, by November, had to have the papers towards the three ministries who are involved with the legalization uh, and, reg and regulation. So we will be able to sell it as well as produce it. That's, that's the, the, the part of that. So this is obviously very topical within our, within our, uh, within our country in, in Canada. So, you know, is there a link between cannabis use and psychosis? I'm not going to go into the, the details and all the data here. And Dr. Murray, of course, referenced a lot of that as well. But I think, you know, with the data that we have, um, with a large population-based studies, um, 
you know, there's enough there for us to warrant that public health message that cannabis use can increase the use of psychotic disorders. Now, we're focusing here on psychotic disorders, and I guess perhaps with my other hats, I, I also uh, have to say that, you know, we have to think of psychotic disorders, but as well as other disorders as well, right? Or there are other things other than psychotic disorders as well. But there's enough information, there's enough of our research out there that, you know, we can have that public health message. Um, and in fact, when I go back, I've been charged with writing our position statements for our Canadian Psychiatric, Canadian Psychiatric Association, our national organization, on, these, on this messaging. Um, the interesting thing, though, of course, with all this is that, in the second bullet point there, is that a lot of the, these studies, though, even though we can come up with a public health message, uh, is that we still need to identify those high-risk groups. Right? And this comes back to what Dr. Murray was saying, is that, of course, not everybody who smokes uh, is going to have a negative outcome. And in this case, not everybody who smokes is going to have psychosis. And, and as you mentioned, clinically, I'm faced with that fairly frequently with my early psychosis population, uh, in that I can have somebody in front of me and we're saying, yes, and they're saying, yes, they're, you know, their friends are smoking their heads off, but they're fine. And I'm saying, yeah, that's, well, that's true, but they're not in front of me. You are. So what is it about you uh, that makes you unique that has you know, created this problem? Um, and, and that's not even having that discussion about the continued use of cannabis and its negative out, uh, you know, effects on, on outcomes after you develop psychosis in itself. So this does come to the whole idea, well, how do we identify these, these high-risk groups and what are these high-risk groups? Um, and as mentioned here, so this is under the premise that the majority of teenagers who use cannabis do not develop psychosis. So that then gives us that suggestion, well, there must be uh, some other additional factors that are at play, right? We're talking about youth, we're talking about adolescence, uh, and from my biological side, then we have to consider, well, what's happening in that adolescent young adult brain that creates that additional factor as well. And, and Dr. Crocker will present some of the work that uh, we've been working on. You mentioned the dopamine. We've kind of focusing on the effects of, uh, of cannabis on, the, uh, on white matter systems uh, in the brain as well, and white matter development during that development uh, time period. So, but what are these high-risk groups and how can we identify them? Well, one, obviously, by the topic of the, the conversation today is, is through genetics and who are genetically susceptible uh, to develop psychosis uh, with cannabis use. And, and this, of course, brings up our whole concept of that gene and environment interactions. So, and as you mentioned, we are going to focus just on the one gene. This is for the, the, the study that we have, although we do have some other genes that we're looking at. Um, and it just has to do with Compton. As, as mentioned, I think most people are aware of the, the two alleles, the Val and the Met, as, as uh, one of the, the, the questions already came up. Uh, and historically, that Val-Val uh, allele was considered high activity of the enzyme, Met-Met low, and Val-Met somewhere in between. Um, and there are some, but not all, of the family studies have shown that the Val allele in itself can confer risk for schizophrenia. But of course, that, uh, there's the replications that have to be done uh, with that. So, and, you know, that defining COM study, of course, was the Dunedin study and with that cohort um, that, you know, came out and was shown. And this is what I think everybody refers to because it was actually uh, quite significant, I think, in our understanding of that interaction between genes and environment uh, in the development of schizophrenia. And, of course, within that showed that if you had that valval -val, um, uh, carrier, then, you know, you have much increased risk of developing schizophreniform disorder by the age of 26. Um, and that is if, though, and highest, if you used uh, during your adolescent, if you used cannabis during the adolescent years. Um, having the val allele in itself increased risk, um, but that association with cannabis use significantly increased it. And I always like to show, with respect to that, some graphs, because I'm more graph-oriented myself, although it's a very simple graph, perhaps that's my, my own orientation. I'm um, just showing that just having the val val uh, increase that risk of development of schizophreniform symptom, of schizophreniform disorder at the age of 26. But if you just kind of visually compare that to this, um, where those who had can, uh, cannabis use during adolescence uh, with the valve valve, I mean, that significantly increased that risk of developing the schizophreniform symptoms. So, and I do note that, that I put it in the asterisk there, that's only with adolescent cannabis use. And that's an important point. So that's not with adult cannabis use, right? It's only during adolescent. So again, that points to, okay, again, what's happening during that brain development period of adolescent and young adulthood where cannabis can have that influence, right? And how does it have that influence on which genetically susceptible group as well? So these are all the layers that we have to try and unravel. 
Um, as was mentioned, there's been some issues with some re uh, reproducibility of, of this data. There are groups that have reproduced it. There are other groups that have not reproduced it as well. So there are some, some issues with that. So our, our first run at our data set uh, in this sample, uh, the two-site sample, uh, was really to look at COMPT. And we really just wanted to, to show uh, with our data set, you know, can we actually replicate some of this on a smaller scale? Um, and with our hypothesis there showing that, you know, that comp val, val genotype would confer an earlier age of onset of psychosis after adolescent cannabis use. So that was what we were, we were getting at. Um, so our methods for this, so we had the two sites between Edmonton, Alberta and, and, and Halifax as, as well, and we recruited from both sites. Um, they're both of them are early intervention programs, so the diagnoses, uh, both programs are, are there, very typical of an early intervention program, schizophrenia, schizoaffective, schizophreniform. Um, we did collect very detailed information on cannabis use, um, and this was a method that was developed by Dr. Scott Purden, who is our collaborator with us, with us as well, uh, which included interview as well as some computerized self-rating uh, drug screens additionally. Um, all the DNA was, uh, uh, was uh, extracted and, uh, via saliva, not from blood, uh, and all that was analyzed in Dr. Aitchinson's uh, uh, lab uh, as the geneticist. So just to go over just overall some of our results in this study. So, you know, first pass, we had 175 individuals who met the diagnostic criteria, and we had that data available for age of onset of psychosis, cannabis use, and the comp genotype. Now, if we look at just overall kind of broad strokes with the initial uh, results, uh, what we were able to see within our sample is that lifetime cannabis use was more common among males. That kind of should goes with a lot of our population data. Uh, and that first cannabis use under the age of 20 was more common in males as well, right? So again, that sort of replicates what we're seeing in some of the data as well. We did do a time to event analysis as well. And male subjects, um, just overall, had an earlier age of diagnosis of psychosis than females. So this is, I'm trying to build the layers and kind of building the story here with, with this. And the last uh, bullet point on this over, sort of you know, sort of larger snapshot, um, that extent of lifetime cannabis use was associated with the earlier age of onset of psychosis. So, you know, that, that's great because that's, that's replicating what we're seeing. So the more you're smoking, uh, the earlier you are uh, with respect to the age of, of psychosis. So then we bring in um, what's the interaction between cannabis and, and the comp genotype. And what we were able to show within our data set here was that definitely that, that val, -val uh, homozygotes had about two times more likely than the Mets uh, to have a history of lifetime cannabis use. And that association remains si significant after adjusting for gender. Um, and that's an important point that I'll, I'll mention after, just after the next point, which is that val, -val was associated with a two-fold increased risk of early use uh, uh, compared to the met met. All right. So that's just looking at the interactions between cannabis and, and comp. Gender is an important point, and I think we really have to move in the direction of, of not only controlling for gender, uh, but also looking at the differences in gender. It's something that our group has moved on to looking at these, these uh, gender differences, um, because we are seeing significant uh, different types of interactions in, in, uh, with respect to gender, uh, cannabis, and psychosis, uh, not only in an onset, but also within uh, care as well. If we then looked at our other results, and those who used cannabis, uh, first use of cannabis before the age of 20 was associated with early age of onset of psychosis. So then, you know, given all these findings, we wanted to look at then, okay, what's the relationship of all three of these things together, cannabis, Compton, and, and psychosis. And yes, we were able to replicate within our data set that the Compt had a significant effect on age of onset uh, of psychosis with val, val patients developing the psychosis uh, earliest. So it was val, 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 met, met, met as well. Um, and it, unfortunately, that, that was including gender, uh, or males use cannabis, when you include the gender, the trend remained as well. Um, but the important point is the last one is that that effect of, of COMPT on age of onset of psychosis uh, was not significant without taking the cannabis into account, right? So I think that's showing again just that, that gender, uh, sorry, the, I'm fixated on gender, um, that interaction between cannabis um, uh, and psychosis and the genetics. So, I'm sorry, that was just showing the, the plot of the, uh, the effects there on age. So, you know, from conclusions with respect to this, I mean, we were able to show that comp val, val was a predictor of earlier age of onset of psychosis in those who first used cannabis before the age of 20. 
okay? Uh, and an important point there, and that the actual comp valve valve was associated with lifetime cannabis use with younger first use uh, of cannabis as well. So we were able to replicate uh, a number of studies uh, from the CASPI work. And again, so what alluded to Dr. Murray is, is that we had a primarily Caucasian sample, and so that may be why we were able to replicate uh, uh, some of this data. And we, we actually, and that's how we set up the study, uh, is that we're primarily Caucasian, European, an European ancestry. Uh, as well, which may be a reason why we're not showing the same results as, say, some of the Spanish studies or other studies as well that are showing some differences between uh, VAL and, and, and VALMEP. So, so I like to step back and say, well, what do we, we, do we do with all this? And so I, you know, I talk a fair bit with respect to cannabis. I, I have this schematic that I, I like to show, um, and I think there's, there's other ways of us using this type of schematic to then come back to, I guess this is my other hat with, you know, how do we present this publicly within that public health realm as well? Um, and this is just illustrating that, you know, as individuals, as our youth and young adults, you know, we're going to have high gen genetic vulnerability, low genetic vulnerability. You know, what is that? I mean, is it COMPT? Is it uh, AKT1? Is it uh, and other enzymes or, and, and other genes? Uh, either way, that early initiation of cannabis use can send you on di different trajectories, right? So if you're high genetic vulnerability, you can get that, neuro that uh, disrupted neurodevelopmental processes during those adolescent years that could lead to psychosis. And if you carry that on then with ongoing use, uh, well, you'll get the poor outcomes. But it is, as we know that even with the psychosis and you stop cannabis use, there is that potential for better outcomes. Um, even those though, individuals with a low genetic vulnerability, though, I still think we, have to, we can't say for 100% that they would never, you know, with early use, get psychosis. I think that potential is still there. And we have to figure out and we have to understand that a bit more. Um, but you can, of course, even with that low genetic vulnerability, get the uh, uh, subclinical symptoms with, again, cessation of the cannabis, uh, get good outcomes. So I like to use this when, when, when speaking more public sort of situations. So, you know, it does come down to, you know, do we target clinical interventions with respect to the high-risk genotype groups? Um, and I think that definitely that's a possibility. We have to have more information on this, though. I mean, we can't just rely on COMPT. I mean, we have to rely on everything else, all the work done on the polygenic scores, on, on everything else as well. Um, but it would be a, a good situation where we could allow somebody to, to be at, uh, you know, figure out who is at risk. Um, so the, basically some of the other implications of, of this type of work though as well is uh, we, we still within our own intervention programs, we have to ensure that we have that true integrated care so that all members of our treatment team uh, have that expertise and that knowledge in psychosis um, as well as substance use. I think that's an important point. Um, I, I think my own, you know, doing the, some of this work and, and reading the literature, we, we have to improve um, on our, some of our substance use quantification methods. Right? Uh, I think as you read the different studies, how people are quantifying substance use is different. Um, and the, I, I still think we have to, uh, I challenge people perhaps here in the audience, we need to come up with a really good way of a very a simple but, uh, but comprehensive way of collecting some of this, this data. Um, the other thing is what do we, you know, as a knowledge translation uh, person as well, what do we do with this information? And, and, you know, we have to develop and deploy and assess these educational uh, initiatives directed at, at, I would say, the junior, what we call in Canada junior high school, which is the 11 to 14-year-old uh, uh, age group. And this is a process that we are, in, uh, we are doing. We're developing those materials. We're getting the youth involved with the development uh, of those materials as well, which I have to say, if anybody's done that, is, is a great process. Uh, because you, you go into a, a room, you hand them creative and, and the, some of the creative materials, and you say, you know, what do you think of this? And uh, most of them just throw it all out, and they tell you kind of what they want to hear and what they want to see. Um, so that's sort of what, from a knowledge translation part, that's an, another thing that our, our group is working on now as well. And I mean, overall, we still have to continue this evaluation of the genetic and, and environment interaction, uh, including the mechanisms. Uh, so I think we still need to figure out some of the biology behind why. Right, uh, this is all occurring, uh, especially again within that developmenting, uh, developmenting, developmental uh, brain that happens in adolescence and, and uh, young adulthood. So I think I will stop there, just acknowledging that everybody in our in our labs, Aitchison and Purden Labs in, in Edmonton, and, and our own labs as well. 
Um, and then, just to you know, we, although this is a, a genetic imaging study and presenting on COMPT, we did actually collect for some of the other genes uh, as well of, of risk uh, that Dr. Murray had mentioned, and we'll be looking at that, but this is just the first, uh, the, f the first ones that we looked at. So I'll leave it at that. If uh, anybody has any questions, we've got time for a couple. Sure. We'll have to get the mic. Sorry, Candace, can you? Thank you. <laughs> Thank you very much. Very interesting data. Going back to the analysis on Compton cannabis, I'm quite intrigued. So you find an effect on, of Compt Valval on time of cannabis initiation. So you find that the one that carried the Valval are the one that starts earlier. I was wondering when you do the analysis on Compt Valval versus age of onset of psychosis, if you control for the effect of age and initiation of cannabis. I mean, I wonder how much of the effect on age of onset of psychosis is just an interaction with Compt or is an effect of these people having started use cannabis earlier? Or if you have looked at disentangling the two Yeah, aspects. Yeah, I think the initial look at this data is presented Thank here. You. We did um, look at. Uh, uh, qualify for lifetime use, um, but I think that's a good point. We have to go back into this data set, and, and we're going to be flushing out a little bit more. But this was our first our first go. But I think that's a that's a good point. Because it might be that there is a yeah. correlation, but it might even be that when you look at the subgroup of the the one that starts earlier, you have even a greater effect in the context of COMPT for the age of onset. Right. So yeah. you can go both ways. Yeah, no, I I agree. Thank you, <laughs> uh, Candice. I think back. This is a more general question, but as we see the potential antipsychotic effects of certain ingredients of THC, um, does legalization hold the promise that we could create a better balance between psychotomimetic effects and antipsychotic effects? Yeah, I think that's that's a great question, and and this is sort of what we're some of what we're struggling with now in in Canada and being asked. Uh, because we are, you know, the knowledge experts in this area within, uh, you know, the, the, the government's asking us so what, as well, you know, what do we think on this? I mean, I think that does offer an opportunity, you know, to look at the, the constituents. Um, I guess it comes to how much information do we really have and how confident are we on some of that information between the cannabidiols and the other constituents and, you know, what is the right ratio? What would we be comfortable with? So it, it is a... Um, it's iffy, I say it this way. But you're right, it, the interesting thing is that this is allowing us to have that discussion. And I think that's an important point. Um, and I think it's also important that we, you know, we need to act on the information that we have now, uh, rather than saying, okay, we'll wait for 10, 15, you know, till that inf information comes out. I think we still have to work with the information we have now to inform that sort of decision process uh, at that governmental level. Yep. Oh, Dr. Murray. I just had a comment on John's question. By chance, we've just got a grant from the MRC to, to uh, try and uh, establish what is a safe uh, cannabis. Is it possible to find a cannabis that people will like to take that will not make them more likely to go psychotic? The trouble with CBD is it doesn't give you much of a high. So you probably have to have a little bit at least of THC, but then does that say, uh, I run the risk of increasing psychosis. So, yeah. Yeah, good point. If, if, of course, the trouble is that you, you, you couldn't, if, if we do find a safe cannabis, we can't patent it because it's natural. <laughs> oh, there's an argument there with the opium plant and what we've done with that. So, <laughs> um, great. So, I'll end there. I think, yeah. Uh, and next we have uh, Dr. Candice uh, Crocker, um, fortunate to have, will be speaking on, again, the, the abstract's not in your, in your book on, on imaging uh, in, in this area. Uh, very fortunate Candice was a, a postdoc of mine and this was therefore easy to recruit to come in to sub for somebody who couldn't make it. Uh, <laughs> um, and Candice, I'll let it go from there. Go forward. All right, so I'm going to do uh, a, a reasonably light but somewhat in depth. I'm aiming for the middle road here of neuroimaging uh, on, and the cannabis use. So, 
my interest in cannabis use in part comes from, from this angle. So we, we know that adolescent cannabis use can affect cognition in a variety of ways. There's some disagreement as to how much uh, the effects perdure after abstinence. But uh, it, it do, there definitely does seem to be an effect on the brain. And so my question is, can we look inside the brain and see some structural correlates of why we see these changes in, in behavior and cognition? Um, it's particularly a concern in Canada, with, uh, of course, with our imminent legalization. And I have my time cover here uh, to remind me to say that I don't have a lot of information to pass along with you, to you for a whole variety of reasons, not the least of which is the underfunding of, of cannabis research. Oops, wrong way. There we go. So what do we know about psychosis, cannabis use, and the brain? Uh, I cite a, a reasonably recent uh, a systematic review on the subject to show you the paucity of research. I've recently updated this as a book chapter, but it's, uh, it's a very small number of studies, in particular when you're looking at early psychosis and ultra-high risk individuals, you're talking about a, ha a handful of studies. There's only been a couple more since this, this review has come out. I have the chemical structure of the four most common constituents in cannabis down the side of this uh, slide to also remind me to tell you another thing about the problems with this research. So these are the four most common compounds, cannabinoids, in cannabis. However, depending on the strain, there may be as many as 100 different cannabinoids inside cannabis. And the most disturbing part of this is that we don't know what the majority of those cannabinoids do. So I liken this when I'm doing some of my talks to uh, handing a patient uh, a pill bottle with 60 different pills in it and say, here, take this, you'll feel better. Most people would find that just a horrifying way to approach treatment, yet uh, in Canada especially, the idea of medical marijuana as a cure-all has really come into the mainstream. Uh, why do we think cannabis may actually have an effect on the brain? Um, the brain structural abnormalities that we see from these imaging studies actually the, the, they correlate with where we know the biggest receptor density is in the human brain. And I actually have a different reason for preferring humans to animals for this research, because the, um, the distribution of CB1 receptors is very different in humans and in rats. So I think actually doing this research in humans is much more valid. So, we operate on the two-hit hypothesis model. We look at where we consider the genetic underpinnings in our group, and we also consider a second hit. And it, there may be a whole variety of second hits. If you uh, believe the GWAS studies, there may be as many as different as, as eight different types of schizophrenia. Uh, but certainly, one of these is clearly cannabis. And the biological underpinnings of the cannabis effect on psychosis, uh, I believe, has to do with white matter. Why do I believe this? Because the, the CB1 receptors are located on the white matter, particularly adolescent cannabis use, because the um, endocannabinoid system, the reason it's actually in your brain, is in part to go and, uh, and, and uh, direct the development of the brain. So if you have exogenous cannabis coming into the system at a high level during development, you are potentially skewing that entire system and getting aberrant development. So I'm going to talk today about studies from our group that are in two different fields of neuroimaging. And I don't expect that, especially since I've sort of parachuted into this, as I realized I am not in the abstract book, uh, I thought I would do a, a brief primer on each before I talk about the results. So the first of these techniques is a study we did with diffusion tensor imaging. And diffusion tensor imaging is based on the diffusion of water in your brain. So if you think parts, say, in your ventricles where water is really moving are considered isotropic, and parts of your brain where um, the water is constrained are anisotropic. And uh, you can look in this ellipsoid model in the gray and the white in the corner. So you could get 
areas that would be in black, which would be freely moving water, and then areas where it's constrained and, isotrop and anisotropic, and white, and those are the white matter. Inside each area in your MRI scan, you can go and get the direction generally of the water in that area, and this gives you an ellipsoid function. And you can use that to trace the tracks in the brain, but more commonly people use it to generate something called a fractional anis anisotropy, or FA measure. The FA measure will tell you how well myelinated, how constrained the water is in that area. When we look at white matter in adolescent cannabis use, you're really only talking about 10 studies, and these are not, um, the average sample size within these studies is around 20. And in diffusion tensor imaging, this is very important to note because there's been studies in this technique where the smaller the sample size, the greater the skew to the data. So you really, we really need studies with, with bigger sample sizes. But what we can say, based on this handful I'm talking about here, uh, is you have decreased FA. So this would suggest that there's decreased white matter integrity in several regions of the brain, and particularly in the corpus callosum and the superior longitudinal fasciculus. In Several of these studies, the biggest driver of the effect when they do the statistics is an age of onset prior to 16. Um, and when you have an, an earlier age of, of onset of cannabis use, you get uh, greater deficits in white matter. And these are non-psychotic. I, I get a chuckle. A couple of the papers refer to them as healthy users. I don't know that that's really, they're, they're, not, they're not considered to have cannabis use disorder, but I, I don't know how healthy I would consider them as that. Uh, in particular, I want to draw your attention to a couple of studies that are longitudinal. Uh, so when you're looking at initial to chronic use, you can actually see over time if you, take individuals and measure them once and then look at them again a couple of years later, you can see that the white matter with continued use continues to take a hit, the FA values to continue to go down. Um, in particular, the second study here is, is a really wonderful study and that they actually managed to find, I have no idea how they did this, but they managed to find people who didn't smoke and didn't abuse alcohol, they did drink, but didn't abuse alcohol and use significant amounts of cannabis. So it's a very clean sample. Oops, I've gone one. Uh, a, a review out of our group by Jacob Cookie, um, and I've up, as I said, I've updated this recently for a book chapter. Uh, we're really, again, talking about small numbers of studies, even looking at diffusion tensor, diffusion tensor imaging, if you consider the sample size above 20. So you get the decreased FA in just disease, so individuals with first episode psychosis uh, and ultra high risk, and the association fiber tracts are the most affected. Uh, for cannabis use, uh, it was, there's now, it initially was a couple of studies when he, Jacob looked, it's now up to five studies. Um, again, FA decreased associated with cannabis use. When you combine the two, now we're only talking about a single study, and you see widespread reduced white matter integrity. Um, in patients versus controls. So, if you consider the, our little pictograph here, you get some regions involved in cannabis use, some more regions involved uh, with, with, in disease. If you combine both from the psychosis and the cannabis use in one individual, it looks like you have thinning of multiple fiber tracts, and this certainly isn't going to help the cognition at all. Another caveat to this, though, is many of these studies do not correct for alcohol use, and alcohol use is also known to affect white matter. So we did a study uh, looking at, uh, at white matter in the superior longitudinal fasciculus. Uh, this has been, this uh, particular tract has been associated with uh, the development of psychosis. It's also involved in memory and language. Look, the red area is the, the region of interest, right, where we put our voxel. It's a fairly large area to try to increase the signal to noise. Uh, this is, this is a one and a half Tesla data for those who are, are uh, oh, oh, cognizant of, of the different scanners. Uh, our study population is well matched for um, age and gender. 
um, there is a significant difference in education um, and some of the clinical measures. Uh, but you're, these are individuals that were scanned a little over two years from the onset of their illness. And I'm not going to present the whole study today, but I'm going to draw attention to this, this one point. When we combine cannabis and alcohol in the analysis, we find that there are global deficits in FA throughout the brain. So this would imply global reductions in white matter integrity throughout the brain. This is also confirmed by looking at T2 relaxation times, which is a, another method which I didn't really go into today. Um, so this really suggests that it, it's very difficult in this research to disentangle the alcohol from the cannabis. But it does support the idea that people with early psychosis, um, that, that white matter is severely affected by, by the use of cannabis. And if we think that some of the genetic susceptibility may be that you have a less white matter to begin with if you're a, a susceptible or a vulnerable individual and then you reduce your white matter further with uh, the application of cannabis, perhaps you're going below the threshold and you develop psychosis is one possibility. But it, it's clear that we need to be more stringent with our criteria for these studies in order to tease things apart. The other technique I'm going to talk briefly about is a study we did with, with magnetic resonance spectroscopy. So this is a non-invasive, another MRI technique where you take a region of the interest in the brain and you focus the magnetic field of the scanner down on this region. And within this region then, it, it's based on a new, new, an NMR spectroscopy. So within this region, you can then look very specifically at the neurochemicals that are there. It uses the signals from the hydrogen, from the protons. Uh, in the same way that the scanner builds the picture based on the proton energy, you can actually use it to give you the neurochemical signature. And you get a spectra such as what's seen here. And this is a distinctive fingerprint for the region of what neurochemicals there are. When you look at MRS in cannabis users with psychosis, you're now down to five papers total. Um, one study showed lower levels of myo-inositol, um, and uh, that was replicated by another study. Um, and they actually correlated the myo levels with greater impulsivity. Another study showed significantly diminished NAA. Uh, we used to look at NAA in terms of being over creatine. Uh, but the, the significance of this is NAA is considered to be the major energy currency of neurons. So if you have a decrease in your NAA levels, your cells should have to work harder to get the task done because they don't have enough energy. What happens when you look at MRS with cannabis and psychosis? Cannot tell you until we, uh, this, is, this, this field is where we wandered because there was nothing there when we, we did the, the systematic reviews. So our method for, for this study was using a four Tesla magnet and um, the MRI was acquired again with a fairly large voxel to increase the signal to noise ratio. And we were looking at the, like, a little outside of uh, so the SLF, but also other white matter encompassing the SLF. This is also a little unusual because MRS is usually done in gray matter. You may have seen this sort of study done in the hippocampus most commonly. The study population, again, matched for gender, matched for age, um, less than two years of illness for the sample. Uh, they do have some uh, past use of stimulants and uh, hallucinogens. However, the current use of the sample was just alcohol with no alcohol um, use disorder and cannabis. So these results are, um, we think, very interesting. Uh, we found that, that we reduced levels of choline containing compounds that were specific to the effective illness. So why would choline be interesting? Choline is actually a, a marker of the myelin. So you need choline and phosphocholine to create myelin within your, within your brain. So if you have decreased choline, then you have another measure that, that the white matter is not in good shape or it has high turnover uh, within the, the, the region we're examining. 
You also have reduced levels of myonositol, so replicating the findings found in cannabis users, and um, levels of creatine and phosphocreatine, which is again a bit of that energy currency in the cells. The effect of substance use on its own was revealed by reductions in the levels of glutamate and glutamine in healthy control users. So that could be related to the balance between the dopamine and the glutamatergic systems in the brain, but you, more work would have to be done with that. So the conclusions for this study was the specific effect of illness is a decreased synthesis of, of white matter marked by the cholines, and it, we, but we can't tell if it's decreased synthesis or reduced membrane density, or, or decreased membrane phospholipid or decreased uh, cells creating less membrane. Uh, we don't have patients without a lifetime history of substance use. Uh, as probably many of you know, those patients are, are challenging to track down. Uh, and the specific effect of each substance. So they do have some historical use of other compounds, several of them, and, and you can't, we couldn't study those separately. There wasn't sufficient power. What would we suggest would be the future directions? Um, really need more consistent imaging al and analysis and methodology. Uh, we do these in a variety of places in the brain, depending on the, the group and what we, we were interested in. Uh, we do this at a variety of field strengths. Um, there are, are, I didn't go into it here, but there are several methods by which you can analyze a magnetic resonance spectroscopy data. Uh, we're all analyzing it differently, so it would be nice if we could move towards a more uniform approach. Uh, we also need longitudinal designs. Uh, in the same way we see with the cannabis users at zero in two years, do we, do we see changes over time in users if they, if they do they recover if they, st if in psychotic patients, do they recover if they stop using cannabis or do things stay the same? Um, additionally, um, and this is one of the things we're, we currently have, I guess, in the cooker and the oven, uh, is we have neuroimaging data looking at the, the genetics of the subjects as well. So, can we identify genes that lead to a vulnerability that are showing impact on brain structure? And uh, it would be lovely if we could get a few more studies that are an earlier time point um, and ultra high risk or genetic high risk individuals and unmedicated. Uh, the, the medica many of the antipsychotic drugs actually raise FA, so confounding the, the data. I just wanted to say, oh, my picture of the Halifax waterfront here. Um, thank you very much for listening and acknowledge my coworkers at the Nova Scotia Early Psychosis Program, my mentor, Phil Thibault, uh, Denise and Jacob, whom I work with, and our collaborators at the University of Alberta, who are great when we get stuck. It's always nice to have someone outside uses a sounding post. I'm analyzing it this way. Does that make any sense? Uh, and they're very helpful. Thank you. So we have uh, 10 minutes to the 2.30, so we still have time for questions specific to Candace or just overall as well. You want to make me walk all the way back there, Toba? <laughs> Thank you. My question is actually directed to Professor Murray. Uh, given the uh, etiopathological understanding that you are advancing in terms of the postsynaptic suprasensitivity in the concession of psychosis in um, cannabis user. I'm, I'm just wondering what the implications of that will be on movement disorder and have we noticed any movement problem in patients with um, cannabis-induced psychosis, that's number one. Then number two, the, the practical aspect of prescribing this patient's um, antipsychotic medication. Very, <clears throat> excuse me, very good questions. I think the first one, I don't think I know the answer to that, the second one, <clears throat> I think the question of prescribing for people with cannabis-related psychosis, I think is a very important one that we know almost nothing about. But if you think of usually people with psychosis have an excess of 
of, of dopamine in the associative striatum, which we block with our D2 blockers, people who are drug addicts have a decrease of dopamine in their ventral striatum. So if you have somebody who is a cannabis dependent individual who is psychotic, they're going to have excess dopamine. No, excuse me, they're going to have, we, we, we know that they will have decreased dopamine in the ventral striatum. We're not sure whether about the, 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 the level of, of actual release of dopamine in the associative striatum. Some suggestion that it's also <coughs> de decreased there. But say we then give them haloperidol. We then block what dopamine they have. And of course, what leads to craving is a lack of dopa dopamine in the ventral striatum. In the ventral striatum. So it is possible that by giving a heavy D2 blocker, you actually increase the drive to, to, to get more drug. So the, the evidence of the, 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 the evidence of whether by any pharmacological means you can help people to give up cannabis is pretty weak. But there is one controlled trial suggesting that, that a clozapine is more effective. Uh, and you might think that that could be because it's not such a heavy D2 blocker. So I, I don't know the answer to the, the, the first question as to whether cannabis using psychotic patients ha are more, uh, more prone to TD or, or not. Any, anybody know? No? Marta? Well, putting my heart as an early intervention, sort of. Psychiatrist. Um, is that unfortunately, I mean, I do see patients who use cannabis and have more, if you like, extrapyramidal side effect, but one confounder is that the majority of them are on high doses of D2 blockers. And one of the reasons is that they are the one they're more likely to st stop the medication. The psychiatrists think that because also they're using cannabis, they will need higher doses of medication. I've not seen any published data on patients where, you know, that report extrapyramidal side effect or Parkinsonian problem before they were starting any antipsychotic or using cannabis. I don't know if anybody else is uh, aware of this. So the, the only man who knows the answer to the question is yourself, perhaps? No, no, no. Not, <laughs> no actually, it's not the answer to the question, actually. There is a publication in the 90s by Chingapa that says actually one in 20, I think it's 5% of patients with psychosis have pre, you know, uh, movement problems. So we know that is already in existence. Then if we take the theory that is being propounded right now from a pathological point of view, I am thinking these patients will be, it will be a disservice to prescribe them antipsychotic. It's what I'm thinking. I don't know. But because they are bound to have extra pyramidal side effects. That's where I'm coming from. I, I, <coughs> One thing that we, we do know about cannabis using psychotics is they're less likely to have neurodevelopmental impairments. And actually in the neck, there's a, a session on cannabis through a fog coming, coming up. And there you'll hear Laura Ferraro talking about people who develop cannabis related psychosis being having a higher pre-morbid IQ than people who, who uh, develop psychosis without the cannabis. So uh, there is that, that issue that, that perhaps these are, these are individuals who go psychotic without so much developmental impairment. Anyway, so. I think this is a great discussion. It makes me want to go back to our database as well and look at some of this. But, but I do also want to mention, because we were just talking about uh, the antipsychotics uh, currently, and I, I guess in some ways, I, I just want to plug and under, underscore some of the work that, and our, our focus on the white matter and the f effects of cannabis on white matter development, because that actually allows us another way of potential for treatment, rather than an antipsychotic, is, okay, well, what about treatments with respect to optimizing white matter uh, in the brain, which are not antipsychotics? And there are a few trials involved with that, and we do have to understand that a bit more, but that may be another 
avenue for treatment in early phase psychosis, especially with the cannabis on top of it, is fun looking at myelin and what we can do uh, in that treatment. So I, I'm just putting that as a, as a potential and future and a sort of a, uh, a way we're going as well. And, uh, as well. I think we have time for one more question and then we'll have to end. Sorry, over here. Small comment and a question. Um, on the antipsychotic side of uh, treatment, um, you are completely right. If you are blocking D2, you are actually also blocking the release of anandamide in these patients, which is actually the key to uh, a lot of its function. Um, and if you are using 5-HT2A D2 antagonists, let's say um, something like quetiapine, you are not affecting the endocannabinoid system. So um, as we have shown that the nanomite is beneficial in these patients. So if you actually treat them with um, strong D2 uh, antagonistic compounds, you block the, um, the endocannabinoid system itself, with, which in turn is beneficial. So you have to add more antipsychotic because you are actually shutting down the, um, uh, the, uh, the, um, the endogenous system that counterbalances psychosis. So, um, and one comment to the uh, clozapine story, which is, which is very interesting, That's, that was why I was mentioning quetiapine. It has some similar effects on um, the coupling of the uh, CB1 receptor and the nucleus accumbens. What actually happens is if you use clozapine, that's quite early work um, from Suresh Sundram and, uh, and colleagues, uh, you decouple um, the um, CB1 receptor in the nucleus accumbens, and uh, which actually leads to a loss of um, effect in terms of um, uh, addiction. So um, th that's quite an interesting point, and uh, there's at least a case series of 100 patients, I, uh, I suppose, with um, um, uh, with quetiapine, where they intended to show that it's beneficial towards alcohol use in psychotic patients, but what actually happened was that the alcohol use was going down only slightly, but the cannabis use was uh, significantly reduced. So um, uh, the, um, uh, the, um, the link between clozapine and quetiapine in, st in terms of structure sh uh, seems to work out uh, um, with regard to the endocannabinoid system. Uh, as well, thank you. I, I think the other the other sort of wrinkle along this is just to also keep in mind the our endocannabinoid CB1 receptors are in different uh, locations and density and concentrations. They don't get into their adult sort of uh, location and densities until about your after 25 or so. So you know when we're thinking about uh, treatments, we, I, I think it's still we have to think about phases as well because I mean what we're you know along those lines is that the same for an adolescent young adult age young adult age group versus you know somebody who's 30 plus. And, you know this is just yet another another angle and wrinkle to all this. So I think we're we're going to be kicked out of the room. So I, I thank everybody for coming and appreciate you being here.